Welcome to the Sisters in Loss podcast, a faith-based podcast that spotlights Black women that replace silence with storytelling around pregnancy and infant loss and infertility. Black women experience miscarriage and stillbirth four to five times more likely than white women in the United States, according to the CDC and NIH. Whether you've experienced a miscarriage, infant loss, or stillbirth, are trying to conceive or have an infertility diagnosis, you will learn about resources and strategies to heal, gain clarity, peace, and hope, and find an empowering path forward after loss. I'm your host, Erica M. Freeman, and you'll hear me interview other sisters in loss from around the world who have healed from such a painful and traumatic experience by sharing their testimonies and stories to inspire and help others turn their pain into their purpose. Storytelling is powerful. Storytelling is activism. Storytelling is healing. Now let's get started. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome. Well, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure, sure. So my name is Jasmine. I am, well, let's say this. I started off my professional career in the classroom. So I was a high school English teacher. Um, and just like majority of educators now, I have made the great, great exit, great resignation. And I am in instructional design. Um, so just kind of like in, it's, it's someone in the same field, training, creating training materials, doing that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I am a 28 year old mother wife, um, as we were just kind of chatting about. I love to travel as well. So just young, enjoying my life. And um, yeah, I had, you know, a, a lost story. And listening to this podcast has just kind of really helped me to get out on the other side of that, bigger and brighter and happier. So I just, I was dying to come on here and, and talk to you and share my story. Absolutely. You're the third person I interviewed today who said they actually listened to the podcast. I think people find the podcast, but I didn't realize <laughs> that people actually may go back and actually listen to a lot of different episodes. And it just, it still warms my heart because that's the reason why I started. It's the reason why I still do it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this year is seven years of wow. doing the podcast and it's the reason why I still do it because every story is still touching. Every still story is still healing. So I'm so happy that you listen and now we get to hear your story. So let's take us back. Take us back on your journey to motherhood and share with okay. us your story. Ooh, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. So um, my husband and I got married in 2021. And we had, look, my mom had always told me she waited until she was almost 30 to have a child. So she's like, you know, wait as long as you can travel, get your education, enjoy your life, which I had done all of that. You know, I traveled, I got my education and I got married and I was like, okay, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to have a child, especially since at this point I wasn't teaching anymore. And I have such a soft spot and a passion for kids. I was like, you know, I want my own. Let's do it. So my husband and I agreed, we're going to start trying for a baby. And I think just both of us growing up, we had always heard, you know, all it takes is one time and you will be pregnant. Be careful. You you know how it goes. So we're expecting all it's going to take is one time. So obviously it did not take one time. Um, it took us a few months of trying before I successfully got pregnant. And then the very first time I got pregnant, it was actually a chemical pregnancy. And that was like super heartbreaking to me because, again, I think just just wrapping my mind around what the process of trying to conceive actually looked like and that it wasn't going to be as easy as what I thought. You know, you see folks around you who, you know, they have oops babies and I hate to refer to them as that, but you know, they're not trying and they accidentally get pregnant and things like that. So you're just thinking it's going to be easy for you. And after you know, we actually put in the effort to time ovulation and timing, trying and all this sort of stuff. And then you finally do get pregnant, but then it turns out to be a chemical pregnancy. Um, so that was super, you know, kind of heartbreaking for me, but it was almost a good thing because I was starting, I have, I have one of those minds where I can just take myself down a rabbit hole and I'm like, I didn't get pregnant the first time something's wrong with me. You know, I'm missing something that I should have 
or, um, you know, I don't know what's going on, but it was good for me, even though it was a chemical pregnancy to get pregnant because I'm like, okay, well, at least I know I can, at least I know, you know, there's nothing really standing in my way. So from there, um, you know, I'm doing research. I'm trying to figure out ways to avoid chemical pregnancies, to have a healthy full-term pregnancy. Um, and this takes some months. So at this point, we got married in 2021. It's now 2022 at this point. January, I find out I'm pregnant again. Unfortunately, it's another chemical pregnancy. So I'm like, okay, this is really discouraging. I don't know what's going on. So um, I end up going to my OB because when you're, because at that point, what was I like 25? When you're 25 and you haven't even been trying for a year, the doctor is like, keep trying. It takes a year. It takes two years. Give it some time. They're not really taking anything seriously. And it's like, in my heart of hearts, I know something is going on. Like, please just run my blood, do something. Just tell me something. But they're not doing anything. So um, I have my second chemical pregnancy. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to switch OBs because I just, I want somebody to take me seriously. It could very well be just that, you know, my body's just trying to figure it out. I'm young. It'll figure it out. But I would just feel better hearing that from a medical professional. So I switch OBs. The OB is telling me she didn't really do much testing. I had an ultrasound and she said, you know, I can see that you have plenty of eggs. Structurally, everything looks fine. There shouldn't be any reason why you can't get pregnant or you can't maintain a healthy pregnancy. So here's what we'll do. I'll put you on Clomid, which if you're not familiar with Clomid, it's just a ovulation, an ovulation drug. So basically, it just kind of helps you to ovulate. And what was important for me about that is ovulating on a schedule that I could track. And she was like, I think that's part of your problem is that you've been trying for a year, but you've only gotten pregnant twice. If you had been able to actually track your ovulation dates correctly, you might have gotten pregnant more often. So she's like, let's try, um, excuse me, long story short, let's go ahead and try Clomid. So I do Clomid. It works the first time. Um, she is seeing me in office. Everything is going great. Pregnancy is progressing great. Everything is going well. Um, and then I end up switching to a different OB because the one I was seeing, she ended up moving her practice out of state. So I find another one that's in state. She's keeping up with my pregnancy. And then, um, what is it? It's about, I'm about like what, 22 weeks pregnant at this point. And I'm super excited because this is the furthest I've ever gotten in a pregnancy. I have never seen past like five, six weeks of pregnancy. So this is a big deal for me. Um, I was even like, I remember when I first got pregnant, my husband was so excited and he wanted to like share with family. He wanted to share with friends. And I'm like, mm, no, you know, like I've experienced two miscarriages in the past. Like, I'm just not feeling confident. I'm not feeling it right now. Let's just hold off a little bit. So I'm like 22 weeks pregnant at this point. It might have been like, what, maybe like a couple of weeks, two to three weeks before that point that we actually told people. I had actually started like feeling confident. I'm like, okay, well, let's go share it with people. This pregnancy is going to be fine. So I go to my anatomy scan, which is around like the 22 week mark that they did it for me. And the um, doctor comes and tells me after my ultrasound scan that my cervix is getting a little short. It looks like it's getting a little thin. Um, and just for some additional context, my original OB put me on a drug called progesterone. So we're all familiar with progesterone. Um, and then at the point that I switched to the new OB, they were like, well, you don't need it anymore. You're past that point. So you should, you don't need to take it anymore. Again, I don't know anything. So I'm like, okay, cool. I won't take it anymore. So when they told me that the cervix looked like it was shortening, thinning out, I was like, okay, well, maybe it's just because I'm not taking the progesterone anymore. They went ahead and put me back on it, brought me back in two to three days later. And the cervix was, you know, lengthening out, getting back to where it should have been. So everything is looking like it's going to be fine. Um, they're telling me, you know, at this point that we're going to just consider you a high risk pregnancy just because your cervix had shortened at one point. So we'll just bring you in a little more consistently just to check and make sure that everything is still looking good. So everything's fine. Um, it was maybe a week and a half later 
My husband and I were set to go out of town. We were going to leave right after he got out of work. So I stayed at home that day. I'm just packing my stuff up, packing his stuff up. And I'm just crampy. I'm in so much pain. I just can't place it. I don't know what it is, but something feels weird. So I call the nurse. Um, and with my history, they said, you know, if you do experience any cramping, any bleeding, give us a call and we'll bring you in and check out what's going on. So I give them a call and um, the nurse tells me, well, you know, it sounds like you've been pretty active today. Have you drank as much water as you should have? The answer to that is no. So she's like, okay, well, you know what? Just get somewhere, put your feet up, get some water down, reevaluate in the morning. Give me a call back if you're still feeling a little funky. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I do just that. I, I sit down, I kick my feet up. I'm watching TV all day. I'm guzzling water. I'm still feeling a little weird, but I'm like, okay, well, let me just give it a few hours, get back to her in the morning. In the morning, I'm still feeling weird. I go to use the bathroom. I wipe. There is blood on the toilet paper. So I'm like, okay, I am freaking out. Like I am like this close to having a panic attack because I shouldn't be seeing any blood in, pre in pregnancy. I know what this means. I know what's happening. So my husband is at work. My mother lives like down the street from us. So I'm calling my mom because I genuinely feel like I'm about to like fall out on the ground. Like I just something in my soul. I know what's happening here. So I call my mom and she comes and picks me up because I'm I'm so frazzled. I'm shaking like I can't even drive. She comes and gets me. She picks up my husband from work and we just head up to the hospital or to my doctor's office rather. So we get in there um, and they go ahead and bring me in the ultrasound room. So they're doing the transvaginal ultrasound and I can't really decipher on the screen, you know, what anything is, what it all looks like. But I distinctly remember seeing on the technician's face when I walked in, it was smiles. Hey, Miss Scott, how you doing? What's going on? What you doing in here? Let's check on this baby. And I remember when she put the wand in and everything pops up on the screen, her smile just completely dropped. And, you know, the ultrasound text can't tell you anything, but her face told me everything I needed to know. So her face drops and my heart drops. I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, well, the doctor's going to talk to you. The doctor will talk to you. At this point, I'm already crying. She hasn't told me anything, but I know. So the doctor comes in and she's like, um, you have no cervix left. There's nothing. There's nothing there. Um, and not only do you have no cervix left, but the bag is literally in your vagina. It's there. Um, you're going to have this baby very soon. I'm 23 weeks pregnant at this point. I should not be hearing this, that I'm going to have this baby very soon. Should not be hearing it. Um, so it, that was, you were 23 weeks. How many days do you remember? 23 weeks even at this point. Oh, no, 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 weeks. 23 and two. The reason why I asked for those who are listening, you know, vitality is 24 weeks, but some uh -huh. hospitals will do interventions at 23 weeks and at least two or three days. So yeah, yeah, yeah. the reason why I asked. So That's continue yeah. on with your story. <laughs> yep. So no, because perfect question. 23 and two. So she tells me that exact fact. And she's trying to like break down everything to me. Like normally if you were 21 weeks or below, we wouldn't do anything. Um, viability is 24 weeks. Since you're so close, we're just going to go ahead and send you over to the hospital and see what they say. So she's telling us, you know, there's a good chance that he could live, he could survive, but of course that's not going to speak to his quality of life. So you know, it, it's nine o'clock in the morning at this point. <laughs> My mind is frazzled before 10 o'clock, before noon. I'm all over the place. I'm crying. My husband's crying. My mother is in tears. We go ahead and go over to the hospital and um, everything just happened so fast. Like they had already called the hospital on our behalf. When I walk in, they throw me in a wheelchair. I'm sitting back. I'm in the gown, catheter in, IV in, in Trendelenburg position. Like they, the doctor comes in and he's like, look, um, this baby will be born in the next few days. He kind of reiterates the same thing that my doctor told me. And he's like, um, you know, you're pretty much just going to be on bed rest until he decides what he wants to do it, whenever he's coming out. 
So we're like, okay, all right. So this is what life is going to look like for the foreseeable future. So um, I'm in the hospital. My husband is there with me. Um, Family is kind of rotating in and out. Um, They were, I don't want to lie because I don't remember exactly, not the very best of NICU levels. I think it might be four is the very best, but they were right up under it. So I, I think it was a three, whatever it was. So the NICU team comes over to talk to us and they are being honest about how things can go, but they're explaining to us, look, we're a level three NICU. There's a very good chance that things could go well when he is born. We'll, you know, take him away, work on him. We'll get him back. You know, if that's how things are going to go, he'll be fine. So it had gotten to the point where my husband and I were feeling almost like confident that things were going to be okay with us. I'm I'm a big researcher. I'm a big Google girl. So I'm on Google. I'm on YouTube. I'm looking up, you know, micro preemies. And you see a lot of positive stories. Of course, folks who have, you know, rough NICU stays, but eventually the baby is able to graduate from NICU. They're able to take them home. They go on to live a normal, healthy life. And um, I think it was just us trying to be as positive as possible. We're like, that's going to be us. That's going to be our son. He'll be fine. And, you know, I'll fast forward through all the terrible stuff. But eventually he was born and he was just he was just too teeny tiny. It just wasn't going to happen. And he did pass. And it was the most heartbreaking thing I had ever experienced in my life. It was. It was just terrible. It was terrible. It felt like it felt like I was like God's enemy. Genuinely, that's how I felt. It was just terrible. I feel like like I didn't grow up in the church. I wasn't a super traditionally religious person, but God and I had always had a relationship. And then when I met my husband, he's very traditionally religious. He grew up in the church and it was important to him that I, you know, follow along and I'm in the church as well. So I'm like, cool. I started taking my relationship and my religion even more seriously when it came to God. And it felt like at the time that God and I were getting so close and we were bonding so well is when, in my mind, you let my life fall apart. You took my child from me. You know, it was it was tough. It was a tough time. And I mean, I was. I was questioning my faith, not necessarily in the sense of like, I don't believe that God exists, but I do believe that God exists and he just don't want nothing good for me. (laughs) I believe that he's here, but I did something to him. And now, you know, he just doesn't like me and I'm never going to prosper in life. That is the way that I was kind of taking it. And um, it was such a a strange feeling for me because I had never felt that before. It always felt like anytime I decided that I wanted to do something, I wanted to find my husband, I wanted to get married, I wanted to graduate school, you know, whatever it was that I wanted to do, I would make up my mind I wanted to do it. I would pray about it. God would make it happen. And this is the first time in my life that I felt like there was something I was putting my mind to, I was praying about it. And no matter what, I just couldn't achieve it. I'm on, you know, my second miscarriage and my first, you know, second trimester loss. It's just, it was really, really tough for me to wrap my mind around. So I remember in those months after I lost my son, I was just, when I would pray, it wasn't even like, you know, the normal prayers where you thank God for your life. You pray that he keeps you safe, all of these sort of things. It was literally just like, I am really, really angry at you right now. And <laughs> look, folks say, don't don't front with God because he already know what's up. So I'm going to keep it honest. I'm going to keep it honest. I'm really mad at you right now. And I feel like I cannot trust you. And that's a scary feeling for me. Fix it. Like when I tell you every single one of my prayers were set up just like that, I mean it. I do not. That is so real. (laughs) It is so real. Oh my God. Like I am so mad at you. Why did you do this to me? I thought I was favorite, right? (laughs) And I'm telling you, I'm telling you. And whenever I tell people that they always laugh at me, but I'm like, 
No, you're not you're real. Right. Gotta be honest. And I'm serious. I'm mad at you and I don't okay. trust you. I love your honesty. Can you share with us, like, how did you feel when you left the hospital? Did you all do a memorial for your, your son? No, we didn't do a memorial. Um, we didn't do a memorial because we had actually done a gender reveal. And uh, we did we did the gender reveal like two weeks before he passed. And they had, when the folks came to us in the hospital to kind of, I don't know what their title is, but I guess to just kind of check on you emotionally, give you some suggestions on how to move forward. Um, they had suggested a memorial. And I, I did not want to do a memorial just because it, it sounds so bad to say it, but it felt almost embarrassing. Like I would be inviting the same people who were just at the gender reveal a couple days ago or a couple weeks ago. And now I'm going to invite them to a memorial for my child so they can come and him and haul over me and hold my hand and, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm praying for you. Like, I just, I don't want that attention right now. So no, we didn't do that. Um, we had him cremated. We had his remains. And that's it. Um, leaving the hospital, it was just, it was, I just felt really numb. I just felt really, really numb. Um, I don't know what I was feeling. Like I was just, I was angry and I was sad. Folks were calling to give me condolences. Hey, let me come over. I can cook you something. Let I, you know, I'll come over and sit with you for a minute. I don't want that. Leave me alone. Um <laughs> And it it sounds bad because I know that, you know, it was coming from a good place. They just wanted to show that they love us and that they're supporting us. But like, I just was not in a place for that. I didn't, I just didn't want anybody in my face and holding my hand and telling me that they love me and they're praying for me and they're so sorry about what happened. Like, I just, I don't know if that makes sense. I just, I, I could not take it. I emotionally could not take it at that point. Um, So does it, I hope that answers your question. Does it? Okay. No, absolutely. I, I wanted to see how you process those first couple of weeks because that's that's typically the hardest, especially when people do want to be in your face. But then at some point they stop, they stop calling because they life is like, you know, life has life. to live, right? And everyone's yeah. still living their own lives. So how was the next few months of your journey? So, okay. So next few months, I eventually I had gotten to a point where like I just couldn't, I couldn't sit in the house and sit in the bed and cry. Like life had to continue. Um, and I, I mean, I went back to work at like four weeks and I, <laughs> I, I am a, I'm an active person. I'm a busy body. And so that's just in me by nature, but I just feel like me just sitting in the house. It just, I don't know, just something in my spirit. I just, I couldn't, it wasn't helping me. It wasn't helping me. It just wasn't. Um, so I, I went back to work at four weeks and, you know, I started doing stuff with the sorority again. I started going to church again and it was almost like it was like, I was just trying to put it in the back of my mind. Like this major thing did not happen. Um, and all the while I'm still praying my, my nice, nasty prayer, like, God, come on do something. And, um, my husband's grandfather, he is a pastor at a church in a, another town over. And he has a woman in his church who went through the exact same situation. And she, I had never spoken to her before, never met her before. And she gave me a call like, Hey, Pastor Scott gave me your contact information and she didn't tell me anything about herself. But, you know, I go to his church and I just want to take you out to lunch. Would you be willing to go out to lunch with me? And I'm like, OK, sure. You know, I'll never pass up free food. Let's go. So um, we go out to lunch and she shares her story with me. And it is so eerily similar to my story. Like the first it's her first successful pregnancy. She was pregnant with a boy, just like I was pregnant with a boy. Um, she lost him at the six month mark, just like I did. I mean, uh, it, the incompetent cervix, the whole same exact thing. And I feel like talking to her is when I felt like I could finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's I, I think it's because 
like so many people had reached out to us to support us, but there were so many people who were reaching out to us who had not even experienced anything similar to what we were going through. And it's it's so nice and comforting that people are reaching out to us, but it's different when somebody can say, hey, I'm so sorry about what happened to you. I know exactly what you are going through because I myself went through the same thing. And on top of that, it was great to talk to her because she was also kind of a vision for me of what life can be after this major loss. She went on to get pregnant again. She had two beautiful twins. She carried them full term. Like it was just, it was it was exactly what I needed. So I think, look, I like to joke and say that was God coming through. Like, okay, girl, stop telling me you don't trust me. Here you go. Here yeah, you go. Here's that definitely something. was an angel on earth for you. For mm-hmm. sure. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So she was, she was really like a a pivotal moment in that kind of like grieving journey and just trying to find my place and where do I go after this? What do I do after this? So emotionally, things really started to kind of turn around once I met her, which is why I was so like adamant about being able to come on here and tell my story because I'm like, I know there's somebody who I can touch if I can share my story as well. So from there, um, I did a little bit more research on incompetent cervix because when I was first diagnosed with it, it was like I was diagnosed with it and then I lost my son. Like there was just no time for me to have any research to really know anything about it. So I had done some research um, and then I learned that the next course of action once you get pregnant again is the cerclage, the vaginal one. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. From the moment I heard it, just something about it just wasn't sitting right with me. I just wasn't comfortable with that. And I kept researching and eventually I found out about the transabdominal cerclage. And when I found out, let me rewind, when I found out about the the vaginal one, like I said, it wasn't sitting right with me and I was praying on it. And I'm like, Lord, I don't feel comfortable with this for some reason. Push me in the, the the area I should be going in. Tell me, tell me what the right answer is. If it is this, put my mind at ease with it. If it's not, tell me where I need to go. And then eventually I found the transabdominal one. And when I tell you like the just the peace <laughs> that came over me when I found out about that, I was like, this is what I'm supposed to get. Um, and so I got it. I was really nervous about having that. I had never had a surgery before. Hell, I had never even broken a bone before. So like having this major abdominal surgery was really, really nerve wracking to me, but I had to just wrap my mind around it. Like, look, if I'm going to get pregnant again, which I know I want to, I know I want to try again. I have to give this future child the best shot possible. And this is it. This is the way. So I found, because I live in Georgia. So there was only at the time I believe one doctor who performed the, okay, who performed the abdominal cerclage in Georgia. I live down in um, College Park, but she's all the way up in Augusta. But I traveled up there and um, she was so sweet. She was phenomenal. I love her to death. And she performed my abdominal cerclage. And I remember after the surgery, she came to visit with me and she said, "Um, Jasmine, if you were doubting that you made the right decision by getting this cerclage, you did the right thing. When I did your surgery, your uterus was so like soft and mushy. If you had gotten the vaginal cerclage, there's no doubt in my mind you would have ripped right through that. So I'm like, okay, good to know. Good to know. Um, so anywho, I I kind of How sta- long did you wait to get your from when you had your son to when you got the trans abdominal cerclage? I had him in December. I had my cerclage in June. Okay, so it was about six months. Little yep, old. about six months. Mm-hmm. Right. Perfect. So, um, I, I went ahead and kind of spoke with my husband and we had a conversation about, you know, when do you want to start trying again? How do you want this whole timeline to sort of look? So we decided, you know, as soon as possible, whenever I'm physically and emotionally feeling up to it, let's do it. And so I was ready. So I'm like, let's go ahead and do it. Let's get the ball rolling. So um, because I had formed such a bond with the doctor who performed my surgery and I felt so comfortable with her, I decided to just, will you be my OB? I know I'm all the way in College Park. (laughs) You're all the way in the customer. But let's do it. I feel like I had formed such a, 
almost like mistrust of the other. You know what I'm saying? It's just it felt like you are the only one who I just feel comfortable with. Like I know they say with that you don't really know that you have incompetent cervix and that you're in need of a cerclage until you lose a child. I know that that's the norm, how you go about it. But it's just kind of, it's put a sour taste in my mouth for this particular practice. It's put a sour taste in my mouth for... To be honest with you, because I also feel the same way, is that we do so many other preventable tools in our normal screening Mm -hmm. pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what age you are. It shouldn't wait. You shouldn't have to wait till you're 35 when you're considered high risk in geriatric Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. them to do those additional testing. I agree. I also was in that same age range. Mm -hmm. I was probably 26 and 27, same age range when I got my, when I had my second trimester loss and then they said the same thing about doing a cerclage if I got pregnant again. Yeah. But I'm like, y'all could have prevented this by checking me. Literally. The whole pregnancy. Thank you. You could have easily done cervical checks or just even do a transvaginal ultrasound to mm-hmm. understand exactly and understand exactly the shortening of my cervix. You know, with my son, I ended up having to go through, I ended up choosing to do a vaginal cerclage while I was pregnant, which is even mm-hmm. more risky. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, had, I did that almost at 20 weeks. I mean, it was a full surgery wow. at 20 weeks pregnant. And I, I could have lost him Yeah, pregnancy doing a vaginal cerclage. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about, obviously, the decision to get a cerclage is to, to get a trans abdominal is different than a vaginal cerclage. Mm-hmm. What made you a good candidate for the abdominal cerclage um, for your doctor? The fact that I wanted it and that I had a loss. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I said that because I don't yeah. think people re- recognize that that is, e- I mean, if you had a loss and it was, and it was specified, even if it was due to like premature rupture of the membranes yeah. or if they formally diagnose you with an incompetent cervix or a cervical incompetence or cervical insufficiencies and many different ways of describing it, you are, you have the ability to go get a trans abdominal cerclage um, and insurance will cover it in some cases. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and luckily enough, in my case, they did cover it. Yeah, I had. And you know what? I forgot to mention the doctor whose care I was under when I lost my son. I had actually brought up the idea of the trans abdominal, trans abdominal cerclage to her. And she was like, oh, no, no, no. You're kind of jumping the gun. Um, normal protocol is that we just do the McDonald's cerclage first. And, you know, if that fails, then you'll be referred out to, you know, a high risk doctor who will do an abdominal cerclage if they find it necessary. And I remember I just I was so stuck on that for the longest because I'm like, why do I have to risk losing another child (laughs) for y'all to take me seriously? If I say that I want the abdominal cerclage, let me get it. (laughs) Let me get it. So, um. I think I one thing I didn't understand is like I'm not married to my doctor. If I want to do something <laughs> and look, I didn't understand it prior to getting pregnant. You know, I did my annual checkups at the gynecologist. I had never been faced with a situation where I heard something from my doctor that I was like, hmm, I think I should get a second opinion on this. You know, so I didn't know any better. I genuinely didn't. So um after she told me that, I was like, this is just not sitting right from, with me for some reason. So I'm, I'm going to do some research. Um, and that led me to the Abby Looper's Facebook page, uh, which is where I found out about my doctor in Augusta. Um, and then folks, because I made a whole post and I'm kind of explaining the situation. And they were like, girl, you are not married to that doctor. Find somebody else. And I'm like, duh, obviously. Let me do that. Um so that's kind of how how I got there. And I had a consultation with her and she's just kind of asking me to explain the history. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of beating around the bush and I'm like, and I just, you know, I kind of want a trans abdominal cerclage if you do it, if you'd be willing to do it. And she was like, Jasmine, you don't have to be so nervous. You've had a loss. You want the abdominal cerclage. I'll do it. There's evidence to prove that it would be beneficial to you in future pregnancies. If that's what you'd like to do, we'll do it. And I think it was just, it was such a, just a moment of like enlightening, like, 
I have control over my body. <laughs> you know, I have medical medical control over myself to a certain extent. You know, I can do what's necessary for me, what I find to be best for myself, my future children, my family. Um, so yeah, that's how that's how we went ahead and got that ball rolling there. Um, so next, what happened next? So um after I got I got my cerclage in June, healed really well from it. Um it was my first surgery that I've ever had. It was a little rough, you know, as far as surgeries go, but um, I healed really well and I ended up getting pregnant the next month. In July, I found out I was pregnant. Oh, I wasted no time. I wasted no time, okay? I had been trying for three years. I need my baby. <laughs> I was ready. I wanted my baby. So I got pregnant in July um, and she brought me back in all the way up to Augusta. And she, and this is one thing I love about her. She, she's just phenomenal. She was like, look, I don't mind seeing you as your OB. I don't mind seeing you as your MFM, but you are all the way on the other side of the world. I need for you (laughs) to get an OB that's on that side. And you know, if you want to come up to me once a month, we That's can a, do that, right? You know, but if there is, God forbid, something that happens, I don't want you worrying about traveling two and a half hours to make it to me, which I guess makes sense. So I can let you have that. But um, anywho, the 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 pregnancy went well, started off well. Um, and then I got to the point, it was, so let me rewind because I just want to explain a little bit about like mentally where I was being pregnant again. Oh, yeah. Uh, Let's talk about this pregnancy after loss journey, because I don't think people recognize how. Well, I will say this. You don't realize how unhealed you are until you get pregnant again when you've gone through multiple losses. Oh, my gosh. So so talk about that journey with us. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Before I got pregnant for the fourth time at this point, I was so excited to get pregnant again. I'm like, you know, I'm in a good place. I have this abdominal cerclage. It's going to be, it's going to go well. It's going to be a successful pregnancy. I'm going to have my baby. Everything's going to be fine. And I went and I took a test because I had a feeling I was pregnant. Took a test. It was positive. And just the emotions I thought I was going to have, I did not have. I saw that the test was positive and I said, hmm, put it down and walked away. And I did not think about being pregnant for hours. Like it, th- there was no nervousness that came over me. There was no fear. There was no sadness. There wasn't even excitement. Like all of these emotions that I thought I was going to have when I found out I was pregnant again, just were not there. I just, I hate to say I didn't care, but I just, I just, I, there were no emotions there for me about this pregnancy. I honestly forgotten that I had even taken a test and found out I was pregnant until my husband came home three or four hours later. And I was like, oops, there's a positive pregnancy test sitting on the countertop. So I like run up to the bathroom to go get it, to snatch it up just because I didn't even want to tell him that I was pregnant. Like I didn't even want to talk about it. It was, it, it's so hard to describe, to articulate it, but I just, there were just no emotions there. I wasn't excited. I wasn't scared. I wasn't nervous. I almost just didn't even care. Um, So I kind of went through the beginning of the pregnancy, just very nonchalant. Like I remember in my pregnancy with my son, he was constantly on my mind. Like, what am I going to name him? What type of person is he going to be? Is he going to be funny? Is he going to be tall like his dad? Like I'm constantly thinking about him. And this baby was not on my mind. Like in my free time, I'm scrolling on my phone. I'm on TikTok. I'm not thinking about pregnancy. and. That was something it just I just wasn't expecting to feel that way. Um, And there was some fear there that I just was not ever going to get emotionally connected to the pregnancy, that after the baby was born, I wasn't going to be emotionally connected to them. And it was it was a little scary for me just because I wasn't used to, excuse me, to feeling that way. But um, at the same time, I was also in therapy. So I told my therapist that I was pregnant and she was kind of helping me to somewhat emotionally connect with the pregnancy but I think it was just something that I was just kind of doing I guess to emotionally protect myself like if this happens again 
it is not going to hurt me as bad as it did last time because I'm not emotionally connected to this baby, whatever. Um, so eventually my husband, he's, he's such a, like a positive, optimistic person. So when he found out I was pregnant, he was like, great, we're going to have this baby. Everything's going to be fine. Like he did not react in the same way that I did at all. There was no fear for him at all. So he wanted to have like a little private gender reveal just between us two. And, um, I didn't care about doing it at all, but he wanted to do it. So we did it. And we found out it was a girl. And um, the freaky thing about it is her due date was literally a week after my son's due date. Like the pregnancies were so close in the timeline that I was like, I need for this baby to not be a boy because I need for something to be different about this pregnancy just for me to be able to separate them in my mind. Um, so it was, it was good for me that it was a girl. Cause I was like, okay, something is different. If it had been a boy, I would have spiraled. <laughs> um, so anyways, we found out it's a girl. And I think at that point I started to emotionally connect a little bit more, which was very scary for me. Um, because I fully intended on just not even connecting at all throughout the pregnancy. I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But something about finding out the gender, then, you know, I already knew what the name was going to be. When I go into TJ Maxx, I find myself looking at little girl clothes and stuff like that. Um, so I started to emotionally connect a little bit more. Um, and things were going pretty well. I was, I was staying positive. Things were going well. Um, then we had gotten to the point where I was 23 weeks, where I had lost my son. Um, and that same day, I remember we went to Carter's, the baby store, and we were in there just kind of looking at some clothes and they always have such good deals. I was like, well, I'm going to buy a couple of things. I'm going to push myself and buy some things. And I'm sitting in the line to check out at Carter's and I buy the stuff. And then I turn away from the register after I buy the stuff. And there are like tears streaming down my eyes. And my husband doesn't see, and I'm not a crier, so I'm trying so hard to like keep myself together. And um, my mom just happens to call me. So I like step outside of the store and I'm like boohoo crying. She's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I just bought some clothes for the baby and it's a bad decision. I shouldn't be doing it. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. The My pregnancy with my son right before... I had him and he passed. I had gone to that same Carter's and bought him some clothes for the first time. And it was around like that same sort of timeline mark. And I'm like, history is repeating itself. And I'm just, so I, I say all that to say that there were so many parallels between the two pregnancies that that was kind of an emotional hurdle for me. You know, just to be able to kind of wrap my mind around the fact that I can enjoy this pregnancy. Yeah, there are going to be some similarities, but it doesn't necessarily mean that history is going to repeat itself. So um, I had gotten past the point where I lost my son. I had made it to 30 weeks. I made it to 32 weeks. She was going to be born via C-section at 37 weeks and we made it to 37 weeks and she was born and she's here and she is a beautiful, healthy baby girl. I had a, a dare I say, boring pregnancy. Um, you know, they had me in the doctor's office every couple of weeks just because I am classified as a high risk pregnancy. But um Outside of that, it was it was a normal, boring pregnancy. I got to the end of my pregnancy and I said, boy, I can't wait to have this baby. I'm so tired of being pregnant. Like, it was just so nice to be able to feel what a normal woman feels when they get pregnant is just to not worry about anything. It was wonderful. Um, she was born and look, I'm an English teacher, so I always love some symbolism. Her name is Story. And um, look, we named her that just to, you know, kind of symbolize everything that we had gone through. And she's, you know, the highlight of our story. And yeah, so that's pretty much my story. I feel like I skipped over a lot of stuff, but if you have any questions, let me know. I hope oh, I told no, you. No, you no, it was so good. I, I love, love, love that you um named her story. I was wondering what her name was going to be. Did you name your son? Trenton, I did. Trenton. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was wondering what her name was going to be. Oh, that's so sweet. Love, mm -hmm. 
absolutely love, love the journey that you've been on and um, love that you continue to advocate for yourself throughout this process because um, it, it almost is, it is a process for us to do so. But when we find the right doctor who's going to listen to us that we trust, we will drive to the ends of the world <laughs> to to make sure that we are seen and we're heard and we're valued and we're respected. So I commend you for doing that um, throughout this pregnancy. And then obviously, you know, um, as future pregnancies happen, I hope that you find, do more research and find a doctor that is closer to you. So you don't have to make that journey with the toddler. (laughs) Yes. But your rainbow is here. And I think that that is such a blessing to be able to get to the other side. So I would love for you to talk about what healing in this parenting journey is. I know it's only been a few months. Yeah. Like how has parenting after loss has been for you? And has it been what you expected it to be? It has been. So I know my number one fear was that I wasn't going to be emotionally connected to her because I was going to be so in a space of like something's going to happen, just anticipating, waiting for that other shoe to drop. Um, And in the beginning, in the beginning, I was a little scared, but um, I have warmed up so much. Um, I've really just gotten rid of that fear, just trying to, you know, kind of trust in myself as a parent. I know what I'm doing. Um, you know, that God is here. He loves us. He's taking care of us and that things are going to be fine. So I know that that was kind of my first fear. Um, (laughs) I remember telling my therapist this story in the final weeks, like maybe that month before she was born, I was so like just a chicken with my head cut off, you know, trying to wrap up at work before maternity leave. And at the same time we were buying a house. So like trying to finalize documents there and getting ready for her to be born, setting up things. And there was just so much going on that I don't think I had a minute to like actually look at where we were and where we had gotten from where we had come. And like this thing we had been working towards for three years She's here. She's about to be here. Um, <clears throat> so I remember after she was born and we had gotten back home, I remember I was sitting on the couch with her and we were at my parents' house. I'm sitting on the couch with her. My parents are on the couch. My husband's on the couch. We're all watching a movie and I'm sitting there holding her and like I'm looking at her and I just start like tearing up and I am crying and I try to like turn the other way because I don't want everybody to know that I'm crying but I think it just all sort of hit me right then in that moment like this is what we have been working for um I was I was look you hear so many like horror stories about the newborn phase and it's going to be terrible you're never going to get any sleep you're never going to be able to eat and there's going to be a baby attached to you at all times I have loved it so much I've loved every minute of it. She's four months old at this point, but I remember being in the newborn phase, like, is it going to get worse? Is it going to get worse? Is it, is this as bad as everybody says it is, but I'm loving it because of the whole journey. Like, I don't care if she wakes me up 15 times a night. I can do it. I have a baby to wake me up at 15 times a night. That's okay with me. Um, So that has, that's kind of, been what it's looked like a little bit. I'm just, I'm loving it. I'm really enjoying it. I'm so grateful. Love it. Yes. I felt the exact same way and still do. (laughs) It's like, you know, yeah, I went through all of this for this miracle. I am going to enjoy it even when it's painful, you know? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Enjoy it even when it's painful. It gets easier though. when they, they start we're moving a little bit but when they start talking then I think you're gonna be like ah oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly the first year goes by so fast so just cherish every moment and I'm pretty sure your family and your husband's family are, is eating it up for sure. oh listen they are going crazy about her they're going crazy about her if she was born in March it feels like like I feel like I'm mentally still stuck in March mm-hmm. and it's like she's be five months old, so time is flying so fast. Flying so fast, so so fast. So, I would love for you to leave our listeners with encouraging words, especially those who have gone through multiple losses, um, 
have gone through, you know, maybe um, incompetent service, um, service um, or cervical insufficiency. Those who are really in that process, when they really want to try again and get pregnant in 2024, what encouraging words can you leave with them? Oh, um, encouraging words. Be your own advocate, truly. As a Black woman, nobody is going to look out for us but us. Be your own advocate. Um, look, folks like to say that Google and the internet is the devil. You will find some things on there that will that will upset you when it comes to doing research into this whole journey, but you will find so much good information on there. So, you know, swallow the meat and spit out the bones. Be your own advocate. Do your research. Um, find your people. Find your community. If that's Abby Loopers, whatever that may be, find your community of people who can relate to what it is that you're experiencing and, you know, share advice, share stories, even if it's just, you know, to be a shoulder to cry on. You never realize how big and helpful community is until you are in one of these situations where I genuinely could not have done this without a community, somebody to help me who knew what it was like. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jasmine, for sharing your story. Where can we connect with you after this episode? Sure. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm just a regular old teacher, but you can find me on Instagram. It's um, and period all that jazz with one Z. Oh, perfect. We'll make sure we link all your information in the description box and the show notes for everybody. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and being a part of the community. This is such a blessing. I know this story is going to impact someone. Well, thank you. Thank you again for having me on. I'm so happy that you did. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For show notes, go to sistersinloss.com. To stay connected with us and join the Sisters and Lost community and receive my weekly newsletter, please go to sistersinloss.com forward slash newsletter. That is sistersinloss.com forward slash newsletter. Please rate and review this episode and I will talk to you next week. Bye.